now that is a perfect segue into because it feels like that was just like the warm up. That was a little bit of uh, the sound check before we bring on our next guest. What's up, Shri? Doing well, Demetrius. This looks like a great event. Yeah, man. So I've got a shirt that I want to show you all, but I'm going to get everyone on stage. We've got Raul with his new microphone. And how are right. you sounding, man? Oh, you got right to bring here. it closer. Yeah, yeah. It's right here. <laughs> can, you, can you get the ASMR feels? Yeah, maybe not that <laughs> A little too intimate for <laughs> now, man. We've also got my nodes. I think it is very late where you are, so I, but it looks light out. Is it already tomorrow? Where you are? <laughs> Fortunately, I'm traveling to, uh, so I'm in Seattle right now. So it's, uh, uh, it's the same time zone. Whew. All right, cool. <laughs> so that is awesome. And then where is my man, Patrick? Where There he is. All right, I, why am I in big? I am not the star of this show. I'm going to, as I make myself even bigger, now, Patrick, what's up, dude? I love the Martin guitar in the back. That is awesome. I love seeing you all. And Shri, I'm going to leave it off to you. This is kind of a, uh, what we would call a mix between a panel and a fireside chat. We've got so many incredible Kubernetes people in the same virtual space. And while you kick it off, I'm going to get this shirt that is so good. It is not the I hallucinate more than chat GPT shirt. It is the, I got it just for everyone here. I don't know if you can see this. I got to make myself bigger, not because of my ego needs it, but because everyone should be able to see that says Kubernetes is a gateway drug. And that is what we are talking about. <laughs> Kubernetes nice. on, on running LLMs on Kubernetes. I am going to get off the stage now and I'll drop a link. Uh, in case anyone wants to buy that shirt and support the community. Shri, it's all yours, my man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Uh, hey, hello, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining this uh, this panel, panel discussion, fireside chat about large language models and Kubernetes. Uh, you know, one of the more well-known instances of you know Kubernetes and LLMs coming together is OpenAI documenting a lot of how they've trained their models and actually serving ChatGPT and DALI and other models on Kubernetes. So uh, I asked ChatGPT to write like a small humorous description about, about this session. And this is what it came up with. In a world full of errors, may your code be bug free. May your containers be slim and efficient. And may they always sail smoothly like a rubber ducky in a giant data lake. Is this even possible? Or am I hallucinating? <laughs> Well, well, on that maybe not so funny note, it's safe to say that there is a lot of work to do, uh, you know, especially when it comes to LLMs and humor, and maybe Kubernetes has a role to play in that. Uh, and that's just the perfect segue for us to kind of get deep into these conversations about how LLMs and Kubernetes coexist, what do they, what do they, how do they work and so on. Uh, so before we get into the details, like it might be, uh, you know, a good time to just have quick introductions. Uh, uh, Manjot, do you want to go next? Introduce yeah. yourself. Um, hey, I'm Manjot. Uh, I'm part of uh, Lightspeed right now and investing in um, a lot of these new age LLM companies. So excited about that. But before that, uh, life actually started uh, as, uh, as an infrastructure engineer where I was building internal infrastructure libraries um, at Google. And uh, from there, I became, I became a product manager in the Kubernetes team. This was, uh, you know, far, far into the Kubernetes 1.0 ages when uh, we were actually thinking about Mesosphere and other such things. Uh, so I was uh, working primarily on networking and security and uh, eventually yes. wanted to build something of my own. So left and started up in machine learning infrastructure. So uh, um, and, uh, was lastly at Stripe. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Welcome. Uh, Rahul, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Rahul. I'm the founder of AI Hero. Uh, for me, Kubernetes is not just a great gateway drug. It is a way to just stay high all the time, right? So um, I, I actively think about um, how do you uh, deploy the LLM ops stack? Apologies and, uh, to, to use that phrase because it's not cool yet. But um, <laughs> what exactly does um, training your own uh, foundational models on Kubernetes look like? What does fine tuning 
a large language model on Kubernetes look like? Or even deploying applications like the Q&A um, or search-based applications, agent applications on Kubernetes, and how that can help the increase the velocity of um, what your company delivers or deploys is 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 what I uh, what I like to work on. Excited to talk to everybody. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Rahul. Patrick, what about you? Hey, yeah, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm working as an architect for a startup right now. We're focused on LM planning, which has been super fun to do. Historically, I've uh, worked a lot in Kubernetes. I worked for Joe and Craig at a company called Heptio. We got acquired by VMware. Uh, did a lot of stuff. I put some features into Kubernetes and whatnot. And, uh, over the last several years, gotten a you know traditional kind of machine learning 1.0. And then last you know year been focused on generative AI and now really kind of heavily focused on uh, LM planning. So. Awesome, thank you so much. And just for uh, for completeness, uh, hi everyone. My name is Shri. I am currently an engineer at Autobounds. Uh, at Autobounds, we are building a you know large scale machine learning platform for handling a fully managed platform for handling uh, data science and machine learning workloads. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. And um, maybe we can start off just a little bit about like what are your impressions of kind of you know first impressions of large language models on Kubernetes, uh, especially maybe with respect to training. Where does Kubernetes come in? What does it offer? What is good? What's not so good? What do you think? Sure, maybe I can kick it off. Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, um, so when Kubernetes uh, was, uh, I mean, as you all might already be aware, Kubernetes was basically inspired by an internal uh, Google uh, product called Borg. And uh, it basically tried to achieve the same objective, which is how do you make sure workloads, you know, are scalable, are reliable, uh, you have containers, and how do you have an orchestrator so, so that you don't have to manage that infrastructure. And uh, that's what Kubernetes was promising to do. You probably noticed in that last sentence, I never machine anything related to machine learning. So, so just a historical perspective here. Um, uh, Kubernetes <laughs> did grow up without keeping ML, ML, uh, core ML in mind, and it was more about general workloads that traditional workloads that you might be running your APIs, your microservices, etc. So it was very microservice heavy, um, and focusing on that architecture. Uh, but for sure, uh, there are lots of, in the past couple of years, this is even before LLMs um, became super popular, uh, in the last couple of years, we've been seeing a lot of these, um, you know, um, uh, products, libraries, everything come up that help you uh, basically run your machine learning workloads on top of uh, Kubernetes. Because the principles remain the same. What are the principles? The principles are Kubernetes gives you uh, an abstraction layer, an orchestration, orchestration layer, on top of your containers that abstract away hardware, right? So effectively giving you more reliability, scalability, and and um, um, you know uh, efficiency out of the box. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, what you, I think Rahul, you had something to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and and maybe I'll take a different uh, perspective on this one. So um, a few. Like maybe a month ago, um, we were talking in, in this uh, community called Tribe AI that I'm part of, super intelligent people. Um, and one of the recurring topics that came up was enterprises are looking to deploy uh, and train the models in-house because they really don't want data to leave um, their VPC, right? And I think that is a business problem for which Kubernetes provides a good solution. Obviously, you have vendors, um, the cloud service providers, or even startups um, who have um, Kubernetes native solutions for you to deploy and train your machine learning models. Um, but this is what, you know, um, hopefully what Kubernetes allows you to do is have a cloud agnostic uh, uh, platform for you to train and deploy your machine learning or large language models. Interesting. One of the one of the questions, and maybe Patrick, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Like one of the perspectives that gets talked about specifically with Kubernetes uh, is that yes, it has options to run a lot of workloads in the machine learning domain land up being batch workloads. And mm -hmm. there is, yes, Kubernetes offers big support for running batch workloads, but oftentimes it seems like it's a little bit of an overlooked area or at least something that hasn't yet gotten the attention. It was always about microservices and orchestration of services that are long running services, running servers, whether it is web servers, database servers, whatnot. But if you are talking about running bad jobs, 
yes, there is a Kubernetes job, go do something about it. The community has come up with other things, things like Argo um, that have actually enabled some of this, but still not kind of sort of being the first class citizens for batch workloads. What's your take on kind of like, given that a lot of machine learning workloads are batch and Kubernetes offers some support, but not a lot. Is that is that is there an impedance mismatch there somewhere? Is there something better that can happen? I mean, I'd say a lot of machine learning 1.0 workloads were batch, and I would say more of the 2.0, mm -hmm. like generative AI, most of that's actually streaming. So I see far, I mean, there still is some batch use cases, but I think we're moving away from DAGs primarily into kind of like chains and whatnot. I think that's changed significantly. I would say. You know what Kubernetes is built for, which is microservices. You can almost think of LLMs, you know, as they grow as microservices, where you have, you know, these different parts of the models, these partitions that need to talk to each other. So you need to schedule containers and network them together, right? So it's really the same principles. It's just kind of being thought of a different way. So I think Kubernetes actually fits that use case really well. Interesting. Interesting. That's that's a good use case. Uh, that's a good point. What about things like as we go deeper into kind of LLMs and, you know, a, one of the backbones almost, so to speak, of LLMs has been use of GPUs. Pretty much every LLM that, at least from things that have, you know, generally been talked about, always talk about how they've been trained on LLM, oh, sorry, on GPUs, uh, and then all these other conversations about GPU shortages and whatnot. You know, does, do you think Kubernetes helps there? Are there things that are better because of Kubernetes for using GPUs? and being able to kind of train models there, or are there, there are lots of other companies nowadays which don't run on uh, Kubernetes, but still provide you with GPU access. What, what does that happen? What do you guys think? Um, well, I, I can uh, or go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is cost, right? So I've worked a lot with startups, you know, who are trying to build generative AI applications. And, you know, some of them don't want to use OpenAI for, you know, the privacy reasons or whatnot. Uh, and, yeah, the cost of GPUs is, is horrible, right? I mean, to run these models, it's super expensive to keep these things running. The startup time is super long, right? So it's like you shut it off, you could have, you know, several minutes to try and boot a node back up and load the model weights into the GPU. Like that could, that could all take a significant amount of time. So Kubernetes helps with this where, you know, obviously we can, you know, scale nodes up and down, uh, you know, try to make that startup time as, as fast as possible. Um, but I think there's a lot more work that can be done here. Right now I'm kind of looking at, you know, can we like hot swap LoRa's or QLoRa's into models, right? So could we, instead of like having to wait to pull up a whole node, we just run these base models and then hot swap Laura's into them for special like fine tuning capabilities. So it's gonna work where I'm heading with it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead, Manjo. Uh, yeah, just adding uh, on top of what Patrick said, right? Uh, spot on about cost being one of the bigger constraints and problems that needs to be solved with GPU access, right? So I think. Um, um, in the first sort of wave, um, in the first set of, set of changes, and, and and these changes are all you know weeks apart, but still, uh, just support for GPUs uh, was added, uh, so that you can run, uh, you can enable uh, GPU node pools instead of your CPU node pools, uh, which enables at least some GPUs to be used, but obviously that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Then you know you have these newer things like spot instances being available um, mm -hmm. in, in the various clouds that can really help with, uh, you know, making your infrastructure run cheaper, but even that's not enough because um, just like with everything in infrastructure, the devil is in the details. So if you look at, you know, components of Kubernetes, uh, and this is where going back to what I said previously, right? It was designed for traditional workloads, not necessarily machine learning workloads. So going right. back to details of how Kubernetes works, something like scheduler, which I think Patrick briefly touched upon, how uh, Kubernetes actually decides to schedule uh, and provision nodes, pods, and everything else um, is uh, can, can there can be a lot of optimization over there uh, because mm -hmm. obviously there's cost and there's also things like you know networking, uh, how uh, how much data is being transferred between different nodes and different pods and and where they are actually located. Um, um, so secondly, I mean, uh, if you look at Autoscaler, again, uh, in fact, even funnily enough, with traditional workloads as well, we used to say Autoscaler is the you know easiest way where you can shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, I think it's even harder to uh, make auto scalers work uh, with machine learning uh, and LLM workloads. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work where templates can be provided, you know, defaults can be configured well, um, um, and the right sort of parameters can be optimized when auto scaling and LLM based workloads. 
Yeah, uh, just uh, carrying that that thread um, of auto scaling. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, we participated in a hackathon uh, where we trained or fine tuned a large language model on top of Kubernetes with RLHF using the DeepSpeed library, right? And originally, our, our aim was like, hey, we're going to do this auto scaling thing and enable, you know, uh, make, make sure that that works. The, the real challenge right now is GPUs are super uh, rare to get hands on. So even if you want mm -hmm. to auto scale, you're not going to get it. So um, uh, a smart way to think about this is negotiate with your cloud provider to get uh, to reserve those nodes that you need in advance so that your workloads at least are, are deploying. Um, and then on the, uh, yeah, basically that's, that's, that's the point with the auto scaling, right? I think the other side where uh, the costing issue that Patrick mentioned and um, we, we, we talked about, I think, and this is speculative on my part, so um, who, uh, we'll know in a couple of months whether this is true or not. So as you know, that H100s are going to be released and generally available or starting to get adopted. And we're going to see the horde of people start migrating to that. And guess what that means? A100s are going to be more available, cheaper, and so on, right? And so maybe the market will self-correct with availability, but you know, it remains to be seen. I think for now, um, either you can wait and watch for two months or you know, plan out a strategy where you where you reserve your instances and instead of thinking about like over-optimizing on auto-scaling, um, try to get a repeatable uh, platform in play, which uh, in place on which you can rapidly de deploy and iterate on. I think the iteration part of your um, model is where should you, you should be focused and not on the iterative, like the how correct or how awesome your uh, Kubernetes platform looks like. Interesting. So thinking about large language models, so Rahul brought up this point uh, a little earlier that if you think about large language models, kind of sort of there are two or three kind of big domains of work. One is companies or teams starting to train or doing training a large language model completely from the ground up, like literally everything from the data to train the whole thing. It can sometimes take months. Open AI, for example, has documented how it took, I think, what, three and a half months or something for them to you know get it completely right. Then there is fine tuning of the models. And then there is also prompt engineering. So two or three different domains of work. So Rahul, how does Kubernetes play a role in this? Does it make it better? Does it, is any one type of work better suited for Kubernetes versus the other? Does that make a difference? And maybe even oh. with GPUs? And and I, th I think as as architects and people who are you know designing these platform level solutions, there's no one right answer. There's always trade offs. So the trade off here mm -hmm. is you know Kubernetes is, is a great platform for, for you to be vendor agnostic, move fast, and 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 you know be able to automate a lot of your workloads. But it's not. It, it comes with its own kind of challenges, right? Number one being. If you are a foundational model company, your data is in the petabytes. If you are, mm -hmm. um, if you are trying to fine tune your models, you know obviously you can use um, PFT and um, LoRa to kind of, you know, fine tune only a small part. But then you still have to have the whole model in memory. Guess what? These models are really large. Um, the containers that these would run on go in the tens of gigabytes, and so you know, big data, bigger models, and everything on Kubernetes just becomes a, you know, a heavy lifting kind of effort. And so mm -hmm. it, it comes with its own problems. Just yesterday, uh, I had to like SSH into the node to look at the journal cuddle to see what's going on. Like, hey, why is this pod not pulling fast enough? Because some nodes, it is five, five, like 15 seconds. Some nodes, it's like taking a minute and a half. And so, you know, these kind of especially when you're talking about like 15 GB uh, container sizes, yeah. things start getting really, really uh, hard. And kind of sort of everything then, you know, follows that. Larger containers can mean bigger startup times. They also mean that it is pot potentially possible that, you know, pods may not come up because that much disk space is not available. And then, you know, many, many things that the cost can go up because you're pulling down, especially if you're every pod that starts is pulling down 15 GB of data for every time, like you crash them back off. They're just like adding on to cost complexity and everything. What are, so is it? Can you maybe quickly talk a little bit about what do you think is a is a good you know data scientist experience if they have to use Kubernetes? Like what would be a good? I'm I'm, I'm guessing data scientists are probably not very very enthusiastic about wanting to deal with 
you know deployments and daemon sets and uh, dns resolution and core dns and what not I, i think i can maybe answer it in in one uh, sentence on the best experience for data scientists to deal with kubernetes is not dealing with kubernetes so <laughs> <laughs> um which is where i think and and even organizationally right if you look at this if you uh, and, and rahul and patrick feel free to chime in here i think organizationally what i've seen typically is there's a different deployment team versus a data science team that actually yeah. deploys these models and deals with all these complexities uh in fact funny enough some some organizations were telling me that in the past at least with traditional machine learning workloads they would write their models in python there would be a team converting that into like yeah. runnable c code and then finally deploy like this just sounds you know a hundred steps for me uh, that are not optimized um curious to hear your thoughts Yeah, I you know, I think obviously traditionally it was used Python, right, from Jupyter and trying to make that work as good as possible. I think what's interesting with generative AI is we're seeing it really stretch like we don't really need data scientists as much anymore, right? It's like these models are so smart that now just regular old engineers can pick them up and start building AI apps, right? So I think there's this like shift to where you know, I, I think Python's still ideal, but I think a lot of times it's going to be more actually like taking those models and like meeting engineers where were they on. And one good point i think about all of this is that you know uh, this is almost kind of the other side of it which is on the one side there is complexity but the other side of that kubernetes gives you is 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 composability like there are so many different tools and services that we talked about literally in these what 8 minutes that we've had this conversation about uh, different libraries different tools and the the amount of innovation happening there deep speed you know lora peft so many of them are um, coming up it's uh, it's easier to get these up and running it's easier to containerize this and kind of sort of deal with them in within containers because with, with the isolation boundaries compared to let's say saying that here is here is one gpu instance four of you go and ssh to that box and run whatever you want i'm sure everyone will step on each other's toes saying i want python 3.9 someone else wants deep seed version 4.7 and then it's just like it will be a chaos so there are benefits of kubernetes there is also the complexity of it but the composability and the extensibility that you get with it to some extent maybe even isolation that can be that is very that's very appealing but it probably comes a little later do you think we we are there yet do you think there are teams who actually can benefit from all this you know large scale platforms that can be built on kubernetes yeah so, ai so, platforms yeah so so one quick point there i think it's um, obviously stretching into nodes kind of makes makes sense in 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 ways but if you look at um the non foundational model and we've talked about most of the these foundational models and fine tuning kind of approaches here uh, so far the others which i think patrick was alluding to was like let's say you wanted to spin up a q and a uh, bot that you've created with some vector db and some uh, mm-hmm. uh store you know data going in there answers maybe uses um azures uh, open ai bot or anthropics new soc2 compliant uh but like creating these uh services that can help support these kind of applications can also also work with kubernetes right i think that's that's like the flexibility at the end of the day kubernetes is not the silver bullet like like mm-hmm. we 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 you know everybody here agrees it's it's not but you know there are these challenges that if you were doing this challenge on a regular node that you have set up the community support is just not there you try to google search you try to ask chat gpt right. to help you out it's not there i think kubernetes is just way more adoption and um you know the support that um, can allow you to debug and i think that is part of the developer experience as well and not just having a dev box and searching but also if you get stuck how do you unblock yourself yeah that's, i think that's, that's a good point so- and oh, sorry Yeah, but <laughs> I think it's still best in the business of uh, you know, having multiple services. And like Raul Raul just said, you know, you might be running a vector database, you might have a web app, you know, and then you might have your whole lab. And you need those all to coordinate to build your application. So there's still nothing as good as Kubernetes to like run those all in one place, orchestrate them together and have like one coherent API in the back. Yeah, and Yeah, so and, this uh, all... Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Simon Jot. No, no, go ahead. I was just adding. Uh, uh, I think you mentioned these three, four areas as well, right? In the um, in the previous uh, uh, question on um, prompt engineering versus fine tuning versus training, yeah. and then these 
service oriented architectures i think the last bucket i'll add there is uh, inferencing right um out of mm-hmm. all these yeah. sort of workloads for sure uh, um um kubernetes right now is far more um uh, you know scale um battle tested mm-hmm. i would say for yes. the training and the fine tuning parts versus the inferencing part but coming down to the inferencing part as well when you have and, and i think um at least the applications i've seen are still sort of figuring out exactly what that architecture would look like on having an external vector db not just for training but also for um actual inferencing uh that sort of also fits into the service oriented architecture for which kubernetes was basically developed interesting so so having said all of this i think like you know is there i'm sure there are lots of people who are maybe just starting out or who've always kind of sort of felt like yes we've been able to train models either locally or using some service but we want to kind of standardize on something and kubernetes seems like uh, you know an industry standard almost what's a good place to start like what would be your recommendation for where to begin and how would they kind of you know how would they go about doing this I, I, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to say this, but, you know, a lot of companies have come up with simpler, um, you know, one line kind of commands that, um, you know, data scientists can run to get started if they don't have a, a team that can help you set up the platform, right? So you just write your Python code, PyTorch code or whatever you want for your training, the large language model, and then just have a one line command they will take care of containerizing that code and deploying it on 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 their kubernetes thing right and so they are kind of taking care of the orchestration for you i think that's a good place to start if you um mm-hmm. if you really want to get started and you don't have a team supporting you but i would almost be hesitant to say that that's the best way in which you'd do a repeatable mm-hmm. kind yeah. of interaction so once you deploy like manjot's good point about inferences right once once that large language model is an inference um then you have this human feedback loop that you need to think about right so oh people are upvoting or downvoting the re- replies that the agent is giving okay what do we need to it- iteratively improve on and now suddenly your data is again leaving your vpc to go into some other cloud how do you connect all of that eventually um you're going to have to have a robust platform uh, on top of kubernetes to support all of that and maybe it's not a bad I- idea to you know just um have some help from 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 um uh, somebody who's you know helping deploy this on top of your kubernetes platform or or, or um you know learn it yourself i think there's enough uh, resources available and upcoming that 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 would be super helpful so it's so a fair think... point i think what you're saying is there is there is a layer that can be built on top that to some extent hides some of these complexities that people are talking about and it can provide that experience that people directly you know the you write your code and like whatever run it with some special command or decorators or what not and it eventually goes to the back end and runs it on kubernetes as time goes by you might want to be interested in what is actually happening behind the scenes and it'll that will be a good introduction to kind of start with something basic and then to this i uh, given that we like demetrius is going to tell us that in a few minutes i also want to touch up a little bit on a little bit of these non technical aspects especially manjot like your experience i'm sure there are company people who have been thinking about you know building companies and products that kind of sort of aid and assist data science and ml applications like what do you see on the non technical side like kubernetes for llms does that does that seem like things that have you know that where products can be built that can you know be good viable businesses going forward yeah so uh i um actually this is uh, this is a great question and a great segue from the previous one as well where there was utter silence when you asked us best practices <laughs> i think the main reason for that utter silence immediately was you know see there's no real answer right now i think the mm. space is moving so fast and everything is so recent that uh, people are still figuring out okay what are the you know best tech stacks for hosting an llm application in production uh, what is the best way to use kubernetes or not like what are the alternatives right uh, so so every day you see like new things coming up like there's coveve the hosted model there's replicate which is like completely like you don't have to care about anything which rahul touched upon right there's so much happening uh, and to answer your question on uh, are there you know businesses possible uh i think for sure there is if there were ever a white space to create like you know a cloud offering from scratch uh this is an this is a very interesting white space uh there's such a dearth of gpus right now 
Uh, mm -hmm. There is also lack of knowledge on what is the best way to host, manage, uh, and serve your applications, right? So there is a real white space right now in terms of A, being the thought leader that, hey, you know what, like you, you care about what are the big problems like in serving an LM application, mm -hmm. like broad, right? Forget it, Kubernetes, yeah. forget everything. Broad yeah. problems are hallucinations, right? That's one mm -hmm. of the biggest core challenges for enterprises. Second big problem is cost, which Patrick also mentioned. Uh, and last can be just reliability and latency. So when someone thinks about creating the next, you know, uh, infrastructure platform uh, to serve LLM applications, these are the broad three, four problems that they have to tackle. And there is a good chance that the answer under the hood will be Kubernetes. But the, I think the idea is to abstract these things away versus uh, display all the moving parts. Interesting. What do you think about the case? Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Patrick. Go ahead. I was going to say LMs will probably be the abstraction on top, right? Which we're already kind of starting to see. We're probably going to yeah. see that. I'd also say it really depends on the size of the organization, right? Startups are going to really wrestle with the cost of Kubernetes, and the cost of LMs is already really high. And if you have Kubernetes on top of that, it gets even higher. Yeah. So, you know, if you compare that to running something like a Cloudflare worker using OpenAI, API that gets a lot cheaper, right? So I think you have to kind of weigh like the size of the organization and you know the capital they have available. So. Interesting. Uh, I'll take one question from the audience here. There is a question about: Can you describe the pros and cons of Kubernetes for LLM training versus the pros and cons for Kubernetes for uh, uh, using Kubernetes for LLM inferencing? So Kubernetes for training versus Kubernetes for LLM inferencing. What are the trade-offs? Uh, I think Rahul, you've done both of these to some extent. Yeah, and 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 this is this is a long question, but uh, a <laughs> long answer, which I'll try to keep short. I think when I'm I'm uh, advising my clients, um, I I'm telling them about like I'm I'm uh, optimizing for velocity, um, and uh, you know having a platform that is easily like make that's helping you deploy models faster. And I think that is one thing that I think Kubernetes is great on for training. Um, for the inference side, I'd, I'd, I'd defer to Manjot. She, she had uh, raised that point. Yeah, no, I think the inference side, right? I um, uh, We've already discussed some of the challenges present uh, in managing a model, as well as challenges in Kubernetes-specific components on how they are designed today versus how they're supposed to work. I think one more uh, challenge I'll mention is um, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the LLM workloads might be using these, you know, specific libraries and divide, uh, uh, drivers that uh, work with Accelerate or some specific hardware component, right? And the whole point of Kubernetes uh, and containers is to abstract all of that away. So I think the world is still sort of also uh, um, struggling right now, finding that sweet spot of, okay, I need to abstract away hardware, but like this world does not quite abstract it away 100%. Um, so uh, inferencing, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, if someone were to start building an application today, uh, you are better off picking up some of these open source solutions uh, present that at least abstract some of that complexity away. But I think we'll right. still see a lot of development, potentially new products and services being built here. Got it. And there is also a little bit of this uh, inferencing at times can can be you know real time uh, online inferences versus training being kind of bad jobs. So it goes yeah. back to one of the original earlier questions we talked about that Kubernetes for bad jobs is, it, I mean, it's of course it's there, it's useful versus Kubernetes for inferencing can be like, you know, server-based processes and whatnot. So there'll be some of that that comes about. Uh, you mentioned about the abstractions, like one of the abstractions that avail that's available today is uh, an open, multiple open source projects out there. One of them that at least I'm involved in is called Metaflow, so that you can yeah. check that out. Um, uh, in, in case people are interested in kind of you know learning about abstractions that can deal with Kubernetes or hide the complexity of Kubernetes, but uh, but yeah, I think this was this was great and you know we right on cue we have we have someone we have a person <laughs> with a red hat here. <laughs> pirate, pirate, pirate! We have a pirate, it's, uh, Demetrius. Yeah, not yeah. at all, man. <laughs> I've raided the ship and I have come to steal the show back. That was absolutely incredible. Thank you all, and I will rem remind everyone, well, Raul, I may need to make new shirts now, like Kubernetes is a gateway drug, or I guess Kubernetes is the way to stay high. Uh, that is, I, you can't really see it because of the lighting there. Maybe you might be able to see it. I'll throw up. You know, you know I, I, I wanted to make a joke about kind of sort of wearing your heart on your sleeve. 
Oh. But you know, your you know, Kubernetes is a gateway drug. Trumps me there. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to follow that one, man. That is so true. I know. But I did a little bit of a. I did a, a wardrobe change, and I busted out the "I hallucinate more than Chat GPT" shirt that you can get here. In case anyone wants to grab a copy of that, we've got it here. Folks on the panel, I must say, awesome. And Raul, I'm going to give you a shout out right now because you are running the after party in San Francisco. You got like a bus or what do you got? That's right. So if you're in San Francisco, um, you'd probably know Mission Bay has this uh, awesome outdoor space called uh, Spark Social. The sun outside, it's a nice day for us to, you know, mingle. Uh, we have a bus, a double-decker bus that we'll be meeting up at. There's 120 people already signed up so wow. I, I i think we can get a couple of uh, dozen more so just join us uh, spark social is a big place this has been an awesome panel uh, thank you everybody for your valuable uh, thoughts yes thank yes you. thank you so much everyone this was a lot of fun uh, and a lot of interesting conversations over to you demetrius yeah and any more questions for these kubernetes experts the kates as they like to call it i think that's what the cool kids call it so i'm gonna pick that up go ahead and throw it in the chat throw it into slack wherever it may be i'll see you all later and hopefully thank I'll you like uh see you in a few weeks because most of you except for manoj were in san francisco ah yes patrick not not really yeah.